let you guys know when we're live. In three. All right, we are live, everyone, with Aaron Shiner from ATG Acres, Jonathan Nelson, Sustainable Plant Solutions, and Eric Sola from Sustainable Plant Solutions. That is me, Peter Severi, and uh, I am going to pass it off to Aaron. So, Aaron, take it away. All right. So, I hope to kind of like uh, bring some, not some, a shit ton of information to to like to the table. Like, you know, Eric and John are super knowledgeable <laughs> guys. So, when Peter reached out and asked if I could help, I immediately thought of you two. Um, because every conversation I've had with you has been <clears throat> science at length. And um, what a beautiful thing to be able to share on this platform, I thought. So that said, I think the most interesting thing that you guys have done or investigated and applied to soil tests is going to be the mineral wheel, Mulder's chart. There, yep. that, that's the... That's the graphic there. And um, so I would love it if you guys and Eric, you know, if you guys could just jump into this, kind of expand on um, how we should be interpreting this, what the lines, the green and the red lines mean and and how all this works. Sure. Do you want to just dive right into that? Yeah, I we can dive right into this. <laughs> I mean, the Mulder's chart is, is, gives us an opportunity to look at possible conflicts or, or, or lack of efficiency in the system that we have. And it's, it's, not, it's not any more than kind of a the diagnostic tool. You know, you walk into the doctor's office, you know, they put a thermometer in your mouth and take your blood pressure, just kind of see how you stand. But um, we know when, when we've got some stronger elemental if we're running strong with with some minerals or nutrients, it can just depress or push against some other minerals and create some deficiency symptoms or or reduce the efficiency of our utilization of those. And and too many times, I think when we use a lot of when when there's a lot of super soluble nutrients being being put into a system, um, that competition is, is more immediate than, than it would be in, in a more of a traditional soil system. And I think there's, there's kind of the crux of the matter. A lot of these, a lot of the growers that we're dealing with, um, the media that it's being grown in is, that, that circumstance is more like a hydroponic situation than it is like a true soil. Some of the guys that are trying to achieve a, a, a no-till, and they've got sequential crops that are getting into the fifth and 10th and, and some guys as high as 20, that media that they started with is actually turning into a soil. But when you start with a raw mix, you're almost in a hydroponic type situation. And so you've got to, you've got to kind of look at it from that sense. And when you have things that are exceptionally high and exceptionally soluble, you can depress some of those other things that it, it can be antagonistic against. So I guess um, what you're saying is in these like starter mixes where it's more on the hydroponic perspective, um, you are running a higher risk of particular nutrients suppressing others, or is this sort of just a buffer you do, period? No, you, run, you, run, you actually, you run that risk, yes. Yeah, that makes sense. Sure. So these mineral wheels, these, this molder chart is gonna look different for everybody, essentially. I mean. Essentially, yeah, depending on what, what that pace test and what that soil test says, yes. Gotcha, very cool. Yeah, and those, those, those right where, where we're pushing against each other, um, you know, we, let's, go ahead. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's, um, let's identify two nutrients as an example and see two or three nutrients that are interacting with each other on yeah. this, yeah. Probably the most common one that I think we'll we'll deal with is something like calcium and phosphorus. Um, plant, cannabis is a, is a calcium loving plant, but at the beginning, uh, 
too many times when we when we do that that first part of uh, a transplant and, and starting to veg, there's a lot of phosphorus going into that system, and it can antagonize the calcium that we do have. When you say antagonize, that's um, that's another way to say push against. Push against, yeah, yeah. So that phosphorus can an overabundance of phosphorus can prevent the uptake of calcium. Cool. Yeah, that's pretty clear. And then, so is there some sort of like hierarchy in terms of like how these nutrients um, push each other out? Not necessarily. No, I mean it just has more to do with. The, the what your what your mix started with and then what your fertility amendments are are that you're using and you've just got to be able to strike a balance and so everybody's doing something a little different right you know whether whether they're making their own mix or they're buying somebody that's pre-made and then um i'm surprised at the diversity of of suppliers there are for for nutrients solutions as well right um and everybody seems to have have their own idea with that and, and like we did with you i mean we kind of take it for granted you have a formula that's worked for you in the past and and i look at those numbers and try to tweak it based on um what i see and try to pull some things more back in line maybe like a chiropractor kind of kind of aligning your spine a little bit so you can walk around and run around instead of hobble right those are the kind of analogies that i think really i mean they strike with me like they ring bells when i hear you say like like that's what's so great about your your instagram posts you guys is the um the analogies like the ace let's talk about calcium the ace yeah. in the deck right wait wait well, uh can you just quickly um uh talk about what antagonism and synergism are conceptually <laughs> We, we did kind of touch on it, but um, right. the, the synergism, let's talk about that. Well, yeah, so the synergism are like two hand, two, two elements that go hand, hand in glove with each other. So calcium and boron are two things that have a high synergism. You, in order to have calcium uptake efficient, you need to have some boron in that system. Um, in order to have um, good potassium uptake, you need to have, you need to have an, uh, enough magnesium. But on the flip side, if you go overboard on the magnesium, you can depress um, the, you can antagonize the potash. Um, or, or when the, when, right, the, 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 the element that becomes excessive in, in that blend becomes the bully and um, it, it holds back and, and, and pushes everybody into the corners. And, and they, don't get, they don't get to have their, their time at the party. And that's, that's kind, of, kind of what we're trying to do is, is align all these things so that everybody has an opportunity to for the plant has the opportunity to be able to access all of that does that make that sense? sense that makes yep. sense to me how about you peter yep yes uh sorry so, so what wh which one did you want to uh go to i love i love calcium it's like the newly discovered um element for me that you know it's just for years we've been npk and things and finally it's like what calcium is more important than all of those things it's beautiful so let's talk about that and it, the fact that it's the ace of the deck right so i mean so you can i mean the the i mean like you said the mp and k the you know the royal suite the king queen and and jack you know are important and they're the they're the higher cards and we usually look at those but I mean, if you want to have uh, if you want to have a royal flush, you've got to have that ace in there, and and so and you know if you've only got pairs, um, you know your your ace is is the trump card. It's the one that makes those two pairs more important. That hey, you're going to go up against somebody else that has just two pairs. Um, so you've got to the the ace is always always in play, and it's always the most important card, even when you're dealing with a less than ideal hand and when you can get all of that together in that royal flush it really it really makes a difference in how how that is and, and your your king queen and jack can play a role but you really don't have that that royal flush until you get that calcium in there that and when wouldn't you say that across the board most times when we do tissue analysis on cannabis calcium seems to be the one mineral that seems to be lacking the one thing that a lot of people struggle to get that hit that target is calcium in, yes. in the plant 
And so, um, and I noticed you guys have done a lot of like plant sap stuff recently, right? Testing for calcium and stuff like that. Well, tissue analysis, a little bit different than a uh, sap test. They give you similar results. We can interpret those. I think we've looked at a couple saps, but they're, they're relatively the same. I, I don't know. We, we mainly just stick with the tissue analysis though. So. Sure. Yeah. Sure. That makes sense. Just it's quickly, to... te Texas OG asks, can enzymes help facilitate the balance of the groups? Enzymes can not do that. It can make, enzymes can add to the availability of everything that's there, but enzymes aren't very mineral, aren't very mineral specific or mineralogy or element targeted. Mm -hmm. It can, can help make everything more available and, and more being able to be, uh, be taken up, but it's, it's not going to, you can't add a specific enzyme to make potash come out on its own or calcium or, or phosphorus. That would be the job of um, bacteria, I suppose. There are, there are particular bacteria that. Microbiology is, is, is if you're, if you're going to pursue that, and that's, that's something that, that we need to talk about probably is, is how, how you manipulate some of that stuff. But yes, is the short answer. There, there are specific groups of microbes that can do that. Absolutely. I think that's, um, that's a, that's a good point. And we, we have such a, a cool example with my soil test that you guys helped with um, and which we'll go over later. And, and you can kind of point out how to work with this microbiology and, and how you kind of made decisions that you made based on the soil samples that I had. So do you guys want to talk about potassium? We can, sure. Um, you, uh, paralleled it to the trigger in the plant process. And I would love to hear more about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, as far as potash is, is one of those things, whether you're producing a lot of foliage or whether you're producing um, and you need strength enough in, in that, in that plant as it grows, do um, you need, and, and then when that flower, I mean, that's where all of your, if you will, if you if you do the concentration of of volume of plant material versus kind of like the density that a lot of that potash goes there too and so in order for get to get a lot of these other nutrients to translocate in the plant the the potash, the potash has to be there to be able to do that cool and so it it's it's it's, it's um, it has to be there so it is so is it the catalyst or is it a a cofactor you you will not be successful um producing any kind of organic matter above the soil without having that potash there so you've got to be you know if it trigger in the, in the fact that you if you're gonna if you if you're going to do a grow you've got you've got to be able to you can load you can you can load the chamber you can load the clip with everything but until until you pull that trigger it's not it's not nothing else is going to function very well well said got it that makes good sense <clears throat> yeah don't hesitate to chime in in the comments if you guys have any questions about stuff that we like already covered because we're just brushing over stuff quick and if uh if there's curiosities we'd love to satisfy those so uh, one of my favorites to, to think about is phosphorus because of its role in really important parts in the plant uh, production, the DNA and RNA and ATP. And I thought it'd be cool if we discuss uh, phosphorus's role in those, in those function in those, uh, I don't know, what are they, segments? Well, yeah, I mean, so the stability, so that's one thing that we kind of struggle with. I mean, when when you have a plant that's been hybridized as many ways as it has uh, for cannabis, I mean, and, and uh, you know, not all, all of it was done, uh, you know, really really well, and 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 that plant will genetically revert back to something pretty quickly. And phosphorus is one of those things that gives some stability to the parentage in wherever that genetic hybrid, the hybridization of that plant goes. 
then that's where the, AN, the RNA and the DNA stability comes in. One of the things I have, I have, I call it an issue, it's not an issue. Every, I have not seen a phosphorus deficiency other than maybe an outdoor grow um, anywhere in, in, in this industry. So, um, and actually I think um, it's, a, it's almost overused to some, to some extent. And um, I, I don't know why there's such a strong emphasis on it, but I'm, I haven't seen anything yet in our, in our experience with Canvas that, that's caused me to go, oh my God, like I said, other than, other than some of these outdoor grows that guys are trying to do. And, and those, those, those usually are, they're, they're not as well taken care of. Somebody, somebody says, oh, let's try an outdoor door grow. And then they go and rent some property and it's, it's the worst, <laughs> it's the worst thing the farmer has, right? And they say, oh, here, you can use this. And, and too many times we end up having to play catch up. So anyhow, sorry, went off on a tangent there. No, tangents are good. That makes sense. And, uh, on, on, on the flip side, can you talk about a nutrient that you think uh, you frequently find underused? Like not enough of it? I think um, the, the big, again, the big one is calcium. I, there's not enough, I think, push and all of these commercially available solutions for calcium to be available in that plant through, through any stage of growth period. And the second part is, I think there's a, there's some missing emphasis on trace minerals, but as far as the supplier is concerned, some of those margins of between deficient, good, and toxic are so small that um, a lot of times they do not want to take that risk. So, but I would love to see more boron consistently in the mix, uh, some zinc, um, copper. copper for sure, right? Because um, that's another important thing for strength and disease resistance along with your zinc and uh, boron for the calcium uptake. And, um, you know, I think I, am I, I, in all my experience with silica, it's pushing into this industry pretty, pretty strongly now too. Um, I, it's, it's hard to quantify the necessity or the need for that because aluminum and silica are the two most common elements on the planet. And um, if you have problems with silica, or you think you need silica, um, I'm, I'm not sure exactly where all of that comes from, to be honest. And, um, and I did have some of those deficiencies in terms of the micro mineral stuff on my first test. Um, and I think what we determined was that kelp meal would pretty much cover that as it broke down. And the second test does in fact prove that my mineral levels went up and um, and we'll go over that later too as we as we touch over my tests and Peter has time to pull up all of the uh, graphics for all of that but uh, but yeah that's a really cool thing that you can fix like copper you can fix with copper sulfate or you can you know wait a few weeks after applying kelp and you'll get your copper levels to go up yeah kelp's a nice broad spectrum one that covers a lot of bases and it's, and it's relatively safe as far as application. And it's, a, it's, more of a, it's more of a cumulative effect. And once that kelp level, once the level of micronutrients from kelp establishes themselves, um, it's, it's gonna be there, right? You, you will have a continual feed off of that for, for a significant amount of time. So it's a good, that's what's nice about it. You can't, you can't fix any immediate issues with it, but if you go in with a long-term outlook, the kelp is a, is a really good way to build those numbers over Texas, time. Texas OG commented, uh, comfrey ferment is a great source of these. Um, I have heard of that. And, and I will comment just to say that a lot of growers use comfrey to supplement my, um, for, uh, minerals and my, micronutrients. You know what? That's, it, I. The, the, you guys are so diverse in this cannabis industry. It's really cool. And that's one thing with some of the herbs and even wheat and some of the cover crops that you guys are doing, you can bioconcentrate some, you can target some of those elements with, whether it's a comfrey um, compost or, or an extract or whether it's, whether it's with your cover crop, you can take and bioconcentrate 
specific specific trace minerals using those things and and working them back into a no-till really well and and it, there's there's not that much forethought going into, into any part of commercial agriculture other yeah than, yeah yeah, yeah. You have to worry about when they're using these crops grown to then feed their crops something important for people to consider is what were those crops grown with like the parent source material were there heavy metals in that were there fungicides or anything like that because you don't want to be shooting yourself in the foot i mean i know i know alfalfa you could run into some of that i don't know that much about comfrey dude that is such a cool point let's i want to i want to sidebar about that right now um so i just bought land in oklahoma and i'm considering cover cropping the whole thing just to firm up the ground and i was like i want to use an accumulator plant so that it um, can just pull up anything that's shitty in the ground. Yeah. So I get to thinking about it and I'm like, what about when it comes time to compost that accumulator plant? Yeah. Am I going to be putting aluminum and, you know, well, aluminum's okay, but, you know, like other more heavy metals into my compost? I feel like that's one of the uh, fallacies of, I saw maybe a year or two ago, all these studies coming out about how people were using hemp to remediate heavy metals and stuff like that. And then Eric and I always talk about, well, what happens after that? Then you yeah. have a plant full of heavy metals and then, then what? So it's, you just got to watch out how you're accumulating some things and then breaking them down, perhaps con or concentrating them and then feeding them to your plants. So I don't know exactly. if, if any of those crops specifically ever require a lot of fungicides and stuff like that but i know alfalfa is one that you might have to watch out for mm -hmm. yeah it's ma mass produced so that you know it's like can always have a problem well there's a i mean there's a couple different forms i mean you've got so you've got your shallow rooted plants that you can that you can take and bioconcentrate from the surface but then you've got tap rooted plants like like radishes and, and dandelion and alfalfa that will go below your traditional root zone horizon and pull and translocate some of that subsoil nutrient up to the surface. So you can, you can use just mother nature's way of, of building that soil. And that's kind of the evolution of, I mean, if you started out with a, you know, a place that was deforested it eventually over the next 50 years would reforestate, but there's different levels of um, plants that, that will, will do that reforestation and reestablishing that soil. And that's, that's kind of what you you want to look at with your, with your cover crop. And, and, and I'm sure you're, you're doing some diversity in that. It's not, it's not a, a, a monoculture that you're going to do, right? Sure. So maybe not just um, the comfrey, but maybe like a dandelion comfrey, you know, whatever weeds you got that are deep tap rooted would do well in a, in a ferment together. Yes. As long as they're annuals. Yeah. Few, <laughs> yeah. So long as they're annuals. Yeah. And, but yeah, yeah that, that would be, I mean that that would that's something that would take a lot of forethought and um, yeah, but it's not impossible. And not trying to plug the uh, business here at the yard, but one thing that we've always been encouraging people to do who are making any kind of ferments or compost or composties is to send them to us, and we could you know run the, the test on them just like any other fertilizer, and we can you know help you dilute those and make sure they're safe and clean as far as the heavy metal aspect goes. That's important because a lot of people, you know, do at home compost and they don't monitor inputs, especially once broken down accumulator plant inputs, stuff like that. So, yeah, um, not bad, but also for the good, you know, like I said, yeah. we can help people dilute and dose those accordingly instead of just winging it. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, you guys have been great. Uh, man, you guys have tested kelp, water, soil. You have done everything for me. And every step of the way, it's been timely, cheap, and, you know, good feedback. I think that's uh, one important part is to get people to understand um, our service only means something if we're improving the quality. And I think that's an important topic to touch on is what does qual what does a quality cannabis or hemp crop mean to people? And I think, you know, a year or two ago, someone might've just said 30% THC. And we all know that's kind of a 
weird game right now, but there's other things to take into consideration, you know, rooting time, pest resistance, drought resistance, um, shelf life. I think all these things are what mean quality cannabis, especially the growers. And that's what we're really trying to help people define. And that's what really helps our service mean something as long as we're improving quality. Obviously yield is one thing, but we think there's many other metrics out there to, to measure quality and to make sure that our test in service, you know, is worth it to people. That's, that's, that's the name of the game. And that shows in like the brochures you send out to people. I mean, this is like no joke. I'm talking like a 10 or 15 page, like response feedback. And the first few pages are just numbers and scales. And then you guys actually go into pages of visual research and, um, you know, just really easy to understand graphics that help you un help us understand how you guys came to the conclusions you did. Yep. And I think that's, that's another important piece is that the graphics and all those numbers, they are computer generated with, our formulas, but the most important part, it goes back to Eric and our interaction with the growers, um, you know, cause the computer test results only say one thing, but what was really unique and different is getting to talk to people and understanding why they do things, how the environment are, is at their grow. And then we could tailor their uh, recommendations that way. You know, we don't just print out a computer sheet and base the recommendations off that. Sometimes there's a lot more that meets the eye than just numbers. We lost the audio on you. There I am. Yeah. Uh, you guys are familiar with everything from like the hydro side to the living soil side. And that was immediately apparent when I started talking about my recent inputs and you were kind of, you know, expanding on those. Um, before we get into too much of the other side of this, I want to touch on uh, something that I think a lot of people are interested in, sure. and that's CalMag. What about it? <laughs> tell, tell me, I mean, the drama is CalMag fixes everything, right? And the real answer to that is... Gypsum? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, CalMag is, is basically calcium and magnesium nitrate, right? And um, calcium nitrate and magnesium nitrate and when you're, when you're running a system that's low in calcium and that calcium is the ACE, you don't necessarily need the magnesium, but you do get that calcium nitrate. And so that kicks up that side of the equation really well because it's highly soluble. And, and, but that's in the context of um, if you don't already have too much nitrate streaming into that system from another source someplace else. Um, and yeah, it, to, well, so there, there's another thing. Magnesium nitrate, magnesium is a center molecule on chlorophyll. And um, that's one thing I'd like to see you guys get away from a little bit is going on visual cues of, oh my God, it greened up, it must've worked. <laughs> because magnesium nitrate is, is, is exactly, um, is something that's immediately going to go in that plant and give you a color change along with that nitrate. And um, doesn't mean that that response it gave you a response, but is that the one? Is that the one that the plant actually needed? Right. Um, you know, it plays out in the end. Hopefully, when you've got, you know, you start to put it some tonnage on, and you get your flower, and you see what it does. But um, I, too many times, that's all we rely on. Is that is that it turned green? It must have worked, right? Yeah. The fertilizer companies know that the the consumer is looking for that they want to water something in and then the next day they see the result so they're definitely going to play off that and it's usually always just nitrogen and yeah <laughs> and and i like to I, I rather than blindly do some cow mag, i mean that's kind of why we try to bring a little science to this is to see um to see if there's actually a need for that or could if there's enough nitrate in the system then we've got to find a calcium source that isn't associated with nitrate that the plant still will be able to take up and utilize. Right, so gypsum being calcium sulfate um, is gonna be good for somebody who already has high nitrogen levels, correct? Yeah. Yeah, so <laughs> calcium being, oh. If you get the nitrogen too high, you're pushing against magnesium. So that one kind of, that one kind of, the CalMag kind of corrects itself if it overdoes one or the other, but, um, but yeah, 
calcium, you that's one of the things we've got to find a way is uh, is get to find a way to get that calcium in there. Sorry, yeah. I'm not sure. It, I can't remember a time that we've ever recommended cow magnesium. That, that, yeah. that makes you winners in my book. I don't know about anybody else. I, there was once. I think there was <laughs> Maybe one, one time. Of, one of the guys had a horrible starter mix, and I'm like, anything's going to help this. <laughs> And if you've got access to CalMag, this is the way to kick it out of where it is now. But we need to, there's other things that we had to add to that to make sure that that crop was going to finish and start the next one. Well, that's just it, right? It's important to identify where these products belong and they don't belong everywhere. It's not the cure-all. Like certainly not, CalMag is not the cure-all. Like, not by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, like I think a lot of the, the magic with CalMag was that green up that instant green up effects and people thought they were doing something right so there's probably some of that and right on then, bringing that you know the, the visual cues one thing and you can i mean a lot of you guys a lot of the growers are, are very observant of their plants and whether they're whether they're branching well enough and, and, and leaf color and texture and size and and shape and um they're, they're watchful to that but um trying to bring a little science to why your um witch's brew of what you're using is working or not working for you we've got to be able to quantify that and that's where the the compost teas and some of the some of the things that guys are using um trying to quantify that and say yeah you're using too much of that or cut it in half or double down on it so because it may be that much more beneficial so we but you've got to be able to know what's there right yeah yeah it's all very uh situation specific and you can't jump into it feet first like oh you're low on nitrogen nitrates coffee grounds will be fine like you know there's just there's so many questions yeah, yeah. so and actually speaking of nitrogen i wanted to ask you briefly if you could explain because this was sort of a I know a lot of people probably know this, the difference between nitrates and ammonia, but I think it's an important part of nitrogen to understand those two. So if you guys could just quickly break that down for me. Well, the nitrate nitrogen is highly soluble and it's actually, you can actually, it's, it's good for hydroponics. It's for some soil based system, you can actually leach it back out again if it's not being utilized, which isn't necessarily an environmentally great idea the way to do things. Nitrates for those abbreviated grows that a lot of guys are doing, they're trying to stay in that 14, 10, 12, 14 weeks. Nitrates gets you through that grow period really well, but the ammoniacal nitrogen can't be left entirely out of that equation. And too many times it's, it's a hundred to 200 to one. I've got, I've got a hundred parts per million of nitrate and one part per million of uh, ammoniacal. I've got 205 parts per million of ammoniacal. Ammoniacal has a charge. It'll stay in a system that has some cation exchange and it won't leach. And the, the, there's two kinds of bacteria. The nitrobacters don't do anything if there's a bunch of nitrate in there. But if there's some ammoniacal in there, the nitrobacters will do a little better job of, of doing the conversion of that nitrate. The second part, that ammoniacal nitrogen is proven to help translocate those nutrients into that plant better than straight nitrate nitrogen. Nitrate nitrogen forces that plant to take whatever's associated with it. So if it's potassium nitrate or calcium nitrate or magnesium nitrate, if that plant has to take up that nitrate nitrogen, the other one's coming along with it. And that may not be necessarily a good thing for that plant at that point in time. The ammoniacal nitrogen gives them the opportunity to what's the word I want to use, free choice or browse the nitrogen when they need it or want it rather than force feeding it entirely. And there's, there's so much emphasis on that nitrate side. The ammoniacals is, is missing from, from a lot of these cannabis systems entirely. Well said. I think people are afraid of ammonia, that word, or ammoniacal nitrogen because of its potential toxicity implications. But, you know, it's like without it, you're, it's just as harmful. Right. And I mean, in order, I mean, so yeah, I mean, if you look at, yeah, I mean, ammonia coming off as a gas, you've got, you'd have to have a tremendous amount of ammonia to be able to kill plants and people. 
and that's we're not we're not talking about those kind of numbers, right? But just just getting getting some sort of like ammonium sulfate or even ammonium nitrate. I haven't seen ammonium nitrate in any of these formulations, but just having something ammoniacal based in there is going to be important. And one important quote to, when you're considering any of this stuff is the poison is in the dose, exactly. even with water. You know what I mean? <laughs> Too much water will kill you. So yeah, definitely. Devil's in the details. Same same sort of uh, vein for sure. So, um, and then the one more thing that I, I saw from your Instagram that I thought was really cool, that is sort of like foundational, but it's really cool for people to think about is nutritional requirements throughout the plant's uh, lifetime. And so I like to, I'm going to go to your Instagram and pull that up because it's, uh, it's a really cool chart. And I think if Peter, if you have it, um, let's get that up for the viewers as well. But um, it, if you guys want to talk about that a little bit, I'm sure it'll be easier once the prompt is there. But uh, just, just quickly look look at uh, my screen and do you see it or do I need to keep going down? Uh, Are you talking about the, the tissue one? Uh, shoot, I can't remember if it was a tissue. It was a chart. Here it is. It's cannabis nutrients and growth stage, this guy here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yep. Um, uh, so, right side. That, um, that's something that we're trying to dial in even more. I think tailored for the soil and even hydroponic side, but it's essentially just talking about um, the three main stages of growth for cannabis being immature, vegetative, and bloom, and how we think that those different target nutrients demands and requirements change a little bit uh, compared to stage of growth. Um, I don't know if you want to touch on that a little bit more. Yeah. So, and that's, that's exactly it. When that, when you transplant that, when you, when you get that cutting from that mother or you start that seed and you, and you, and you, you put it in and you start growing it, it has different needs than it does when it's trying to, when it's trying to produce all of that vegetative growth. So you get your nodes, so you can get your flowers. And then when it goes into flower, that plant, I mean, it's just like a life cycle, right? And, and that, that plant changes its metabolism to, to come to the end of its cycle and its needs are different. If we were in an outdoor grow in, in, in a more natural setting, with good organic matter and good biological, the, the soil temperatures and, and, and the microbiological and the fungal part of that soil would help that plant make those transitions. When you get into these shortened and abbreviated growing cycles, a lot of, we have to look at manipulating that from our side to some extent, making sure that plant has an abundance of the things that it needs for that cycle or that part of its life, if that makes sense, yeah. And I think there's a couple main sticking points to that, being that uh, we touched on it a little bit earlier with the phosphorus, but uh, when the plants are young, um, their root system is pretty abbreviated, so a little extra dose of phosphorus is important there. And then I think the other important part, obviously we touched on it again, we'll probably do it again and again, is calcium. Um, especially when the plant is going through that first stretch in the flower stage, uh, the demand really increases there. And then nitrogen, um, as, ni as the plant is finishing, uh, the term that we've been using is called drying it down, but we want to make sure that the nitrogen drops off pretty much towards the end of flower. We're not just talking about a flush, but we're just talking about making sure the plant doesn't have a lot of lush, green, super juicy growth. And we think that's gonna help just finish it the right way and make sure that you have a good shelf life and a lot of uh, active cannabinoids and stuff like that. That makes sense. And let me ask you this, um, when a plant in a living soil system, um, is a plant gonna be responsible for seeking out its own sort of phosphorus connections in the soil via like plant exudates or is this going to be something like you have to dose it with it won't find it on its own even in a living soil system no you, there's there 
if, if you have a, a, an active and, 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 and bulky root system, and or if you have a good active mycorrhizal population, because a mycorrhizae is like a secondary root system and it will go where the plant roots aren't and it between the row down into the subsoil and it can translocate that phosphorus back. And there's a symbiotic relationship there. And so long as you don't have a ton of compaction and you've got good phosphorus levels and, and a, a reasonable pH, you know, all those factors, there really isn't a huge need to add any more phosphorus to that system. And that, that time frame of finishing that plant, it's that cycling that it does, um, it's, it's longer than it is in a, in a, in a greenhouse or a, a controlled grow. Yeah. One thing that was a newly transplanted plant, it, that relationship Eric was talking about, it doesn't happen immediately. It doesn't, no. So it takes some time for the microbes and whatever other life is in the soil to actually uh, form that relationship with that plant. It doesn't, you don't put a plant in the ground and then overnight it's all connected. It, it takes some time. And that's what the important part is, is making sure you don't, you don't lose any time after that transplant waiting for that relationship to establish. We want to make sure that you put, you put it in the ground and then it takes off. Not, you know, there's this little lag period because some people's veg time is pretty short and abbreviated. And that's a crucial part is making sure that we don't lose any time there and we don't jeopardize any quality and health issues either. Yeah. Yeah. Plants slow down, bugs start to come in too. You know, it's like, it's, the domino effect. So that's wise. Keep them moving. Yep. So um, that's all I have in terms of like stuff that I pulled from your Instagram, but I, I think it's cool to talk about, this was Peter's idea, but I think it's cool to talk about um, my test and what my inputs were and what you guys recommended and how that worked out for us. Sure. So, um, I so think for, first of all, tell us what we're looking at. Yep, Peter's pulled up a picture of um, my current garden. Um, the bed is 12 by 29 feet um, by about two and a quarter feet deep. There's 14 cubic yards of soil in there. And um, I've been amending it for five, five and a half years on my own, just reading the plants. And um, only this, this year, the beginning of this year, started testing my soil and trying to dial it in. And really the goal here is to save money on my inputs, stop spending so much money on amendments and still get the same results. Or better. And we were successful at doing that at, in these uh, couple of tests. And I hope to even dial it in more um, as, we, as we do stuff to the soil. And I'm going to be running, I should probably tell you guys, I'm going to be running um, gnarly barley mix next, you know, coots mix, the uh, sprouted barley and uh, sprouted corn seed. Cool. So that'll, that'll be fun. We'll be able to see what's, what, uh, what happens to the soil after all that. Now, jumping in. Oh, did you have something to say, John? Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, I guess we should probably just walk through uh, the process, what Eric does when he first looks at a sample, uh, what sticks out to him, and then uh, we could dive into like the first conversation that we had with you and what all we talked about, stuff like that. Cool. Okay. I don't know. Should we talk about collecting the sample first and what's important and what to do? And do? I mean, yeah, uh, Peter, I sent you a picture when I was collecting my, yeah. Yeah. So obviously one thing that's important to realize whenever someone's collecting samples, um, it probably should go without saying, but you know, the sampling has to be accurate. The, the results that we get back are only as good as the sample that the grower sends in. So one thing that's really important is first determining how we're gonna manage this plot or grow or whatever else. And uh, sometimes, you know, with a larger outdoor one, we have to break it into different segments that people can treat one way or another based on some things that we see. But um, in your case, it was important for you to grab a couple different individual samples and kind of homogenize them and form one sample. Um, I believe you did that. 
I did, I collected 30 samples. Um, I put them into a garbage bin and I spun it and then collected my two cups from that garbage bin. Mm -hmm. That was the first sample. The second sample, I couldn't be so um, OCD about. So I just collected, I think it was 25 samples from the six inches below the topsoil, whereas the first sample I did everywhere. So, uh -huh. so yeah, it's important, uh, you know, sample size is important in all science, right? You don't want to venture into collecting data without knowing that your process is going to be uh, representative of your actual population. Yep, because the grower's intuition goes a huge long way, but sometimes um, we get some pictures, but if we're not there to physically, you know, touch it, sniff it, taste it, maybe, um, you know, we can only go off this data. So it needs to be representative of, of what's actually going on there. So that's extremely important for accuracy. Yeah, and the testing methodology that the lab is using for tissue and soil, I mean, it's repeatable within three to 5%. So, I mean, you send the same sample in over a period of time, you know, months apart or even days apart, you're gonna get relatively the same numbers. But, um, you, but if, if, if the testing methodology and the equipment is such a hard science, and if you give it some bad, if you give it a bad sample, it's going to give you bad data. And so that's, that's so cru crucial. And it was really, and, and all of the, you know, the trade shows we've attended and in, in going to these symposiums, that, that there's telling you that same thing for CBD and THC. It's no different, you know, whatever that active ingredient you're looking for, whether it's calcium and magnesium and nitrogen, or whether it's THC or CBD, you've got to be able to give that composite sample that represents what you're trying to, what you're trying to analyze. Yes. So after that little spiel, um, so after you send it in, we get some hard data back and then uh, that's when Eric's magic really starts. So what's some of the first things that you look at when you, when you get that back? Well, I usually go down the soil test and the pace test and flag things that are exceptionally high and or exceptionally low. And then I do a comparison, you know, a couple other things that are important are, you know, exchange capacity and organic matter amounts um, and, um, and trying to figure out in, in a context of the information that's in my head, you know, where, where that, where the soil might have come from, you know, um, and how it was created um, or been treated in the past. And then um, once I've kind of got that context uh, in my head and then I kind of evaluate based on some of the other in relationship, like if I've got a whole bunch of sulfur and a whole bunch of calcium, I know there's been some gypsum applied there. If I know that I've got a whole bunch of nitrates and I've got a whole bunch of potash, um, I know that somebody's been banging away at that with something that's calcium nitrate loaded, um, you know, something really, really strong. So I'm trying to trying to get a context for some of that based on the numbers, and and then confirm that with the conversation that we have, right? What what you might be doing and the materials that you might be using, and I've already kind of got pre-formatted in my head how we might correct that, but I've got to have some information from the grower to be able to, to understand and verify where it came from and then whether or not my pre-formatted corrections are gonna work. And your, when you say pre-formatted corrections, I mean, you're super flexible. I, I mean, you obviously have a range of where you wanna see these, these, for, these nutrients and you also have an understanding as to how to get there via different highways. We can take the living soil highway where when the pH is a little high, we add raw peat because that is a lower pH and it'll bring things down. Or you can take the hydroponic highway and, you know, add your chemicals to bring the pH down a little bit. Yeah, that's what's, I mean, that's, that's what's kind of fun here on my end is, is having to deal with guys who are, you know, they're, you know, I see the hydroponic guys as, you know, bang it out, you know, get your get your 12 weeks in and, and cycle it for another crop. Um, and, and then the living soil guys are, are more, more into the health of their plants and, and, and the end user and, and, and what kind of product they're gonna offer them. 
um, and, 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 and interested in not only in the health of that, but the health of their, of their patient or their end user. Um, it's, it's really kind of fun. Sometimes there's a little bit that crosses over between the industries, but, or the, the, the style of grow, but not often, but it's, you, you have to be, you have to be, there's more than one way to, to, to adjust this, right? And you have to have an open mind to be able to do that. And, and sometimes it's as simple as, right? So I, I, I've got too much, like your case, you had a little too much phosphorus, the pH was a little bit high. You could probably use a little more organic matter, not that you really needed much more, but, but adding that lower pH peat that has no phosphorus in it was a good way to, to kind of amend that soil without using a chemical to, to slap it around, right? It's kind of yeah, just like and, it, and it did, uh, th oh, sorry, go ahead. It was like diluting it. So there's no phosphorus in there. And, it, it, and, and so we, we, by adding a no phosphorus material to your high phosphorus media, we actually lowered that number. It's important to, to know, oh, um, oh, to bring the phosphorus down. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah, right. That's that's pretty common. Um, just, just quickly, what we're looking at right now is from the first soil sample you sent, correct? In January? Correct. And so our pH was like a 6.9 and organic matter was down around 27.8. You know, phosphorus was, was nice and high. So a lot of these things and those three things in particular were solved by one answer, and that was adding organic raw peat, right? Yeah, and you wouldn't, that's not something that would have been on anybody's radar, right? It's just like, oh, don't I want to add, right? You could have used ammonium sulfate, we could have driven that pH down, um, and, and some other things, but um, knowing what you were trying to accomplish there, you're going to continue to grow here and having more organic matter isn't a bad thing. So we can cycle that, that, that raw carbon that's been preserved in a peat bog into something that's going to be humus for you later on and accomplish some short-term goals at the same time. So, you know, you guys are, <clears throat> I mean, you guys are looking down the road even when I'm not, and that was pretty cool. Yeah. So I think Peter has the second test. We can kind of jump back and forth. So I was, one thing that I think it's important to talk about is the pH actually went up. And when I asked you about that, you said, well, yeah, I mean, you know, you're watering every day. You're, you know, pH is going to fluctuate regularly, right? It, well, yeah, on, on, it can be almost hourly, depending hourly. on temperature and biological activity and, and when, what you have used for water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we, um, I think, did we see the organic matter kind of stay the same? Well, that's going to kind of make sense because our bacteria is, our, our fungal and bacteria are breaking it down. Yes. Yeah, it'll take, it'll take some time for that to happen. Yep. Uh, Peter, go back to the first test. I wanted to see what the sulfur said. So we brought the sulfur up, which brought the, I mean, the frost on this round is incredible. Frost and terps coming from this round of plants is incredible. And that's, I think, that sulfur level is responsible for that. 21. Yeah. yeah, for sure. And another uh, thing that I think it's important for people to realize is that um, the sliders that people are seeing is data that comes from a traditional soil test that basically uses a mild acidic solution that mimics how a plant mineralizes roots. So what's being showed in these sliders is basically a representation of what the lab thinks is available for a plant to take up. And another thing that Eric and I do is we run the traditional soil test with a saturated paste test. And we kind of correlate and cross-reference the data between the two to see how much of these elements and minerals um, are actually making it into the solution of the soil. Um, so just so you know, that's one thing that we're doing right now is we're going back and forth between what's on the screen here in the soil test and then back on Eric's computer, uh, we're looking at the paste test, which is, um, it's not as straightforward as the soil. That's why we don't really have these sliders for them yet. Because mm. yeah, it's, it's all, all relative to what um, comes out in the soil test. There's not really an easy way to 
standardize it. It's sort of like, uh, you know, two legs to the same uh, vehicle, you know, it's. Yep. Well, it's just two different ways to look at the soil. Yeah. And we look right in between those two to, to make the best assumptions. In this case, yeah, I'm taking some of the numbers from the soil test and having a context in what we might be able to create availability with some acidity. But then on the flip side, I'm looking at what is, if I put water in there and then I extract the water out, what was truly water soluble? And some of that is going to be just straight fertilizer that you've used. But, but it, that has a context and so does the soil test. And in the conversation um, that we have with the grower, that, that context usually comes out whether whether or not this, this grow is looking more like a hydroponic or whether it's looking more like a soil. And, and when you start out with a grow mix that you just you know, fell off the back of the you know, UPS truck, um, it's more like a hydroponic. You, know, you, get, you get five or six or seven or eight grows in that same stuff. Now you're looking at it more like a soil. And yeah, and that's really important to note. I mean, I've been using my soil for over 10 years. And when I started with it, I was pumping salts, advanced nutrients all day for years. Then uh, we switched to organic at the, um, at the indoor grow that I had. And so everything started to change and I started to really reamend and reuse my soil. Um, so it's important to note that with these test results, that soil came from off the back of the, the truck, you know, um, like plain medium that's more like a hydroponic base and over the years it's worked into a living a living soil and so this chart here shows um, the historic data and the so the January is the orange and the March uh, the May is the green and the blue is the desired and so you can kind of see here visually uh, how we worked on the phosphorus, how we worked on the sulfur, how we worked on the calcium, the magnesium, the potassium, and even the sodium. Um, sodium was a cool thing that we did because we were worried about the kelp being too high in sodium. And John was like, took it upon himself. He's like, dude, send me a sample of the kelp. I'm going to test it for free. And we're going to end this once and for all. And it came back 3% sodium which is really low and insignificant in terms of bringing your salt too high so i might be tangenting hard here but you guys take over you'd, you'd have a hard time yeah the dilution factor at the rate you're using the kelp it's an insignificant impact on the soil sodium level and you the only thing you couldn't do is grow have a hard time growing plants in straight kelp that's all and sure. you're not so. well a couple of things that might have might have pushed his ph up a tiny bit is we, we went up in magnesium and magnesium has 1.4 times greater ability to create alkalinity than, than, than um, sodium, than, I'm sorry, calcium does. And that was a little bit of a risk we had using the langbanite. Mm -hmm. um, and, and another reason why I wanted you to integrate some peat in there. The second part is, is that your nitrate number jumped up and nitrates are almost, well, they're, they're alkali to start with. And there may be some contacts in this specific soil where there was a, a nitrogen or nitrate-based fertility application that could have temporarily pushed this to 7.2 from 6.9. But that, 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 it's hard to avoid to find a spot between fertilizations for you to be able to give a nice even one and that's another reason why i like to have sequential soil samples so over time we can watch things change and just because i put two dots on a graph doesn't mean that that's the direction that the graph is taking and the more data points you have the more accuracy you have in your ability to predict what's going to happen as you manipulate these these fertility programs it's not, it's just, it's, it's not, some guys look at that as a once and done. I've got a problem, fix it for me. Um, and, and, and this is a more proactive long term. You've got to, you've got to be able to get into this for at least three grow cycles and make some changes and have it be predictable. And yeah. I love to be there for five 
and then we can we can definitely prove how things work. It's a it's a maintenance over time. Yes. Yeah. Um. Very cool. I want to ask one thing about conductivity, and um, my conductivity was down in my soil, and I'm not sure that there's a slide for that, but this is just something you and I talked about on the phone. And I think you recommended, that was one of the reasons we did the Langbanite was to increase conductivity. Yep, it was to push that, yeah, that magnesium and potash up because you needed for sure the potash, but you were, I think, well, we got some sulfur in there as well, but conductivity is, is a couple things, right? That's one of my clues as, the difference between what I've got in the soil test and what I have in the paste is one of my clues as to whether or not you're using too much fertilizer, but also kind of whether or not you're, you've got, you don't have enough quote unquote solution. Because when, when, when you start and when you start out with some of these really green grow medias, like I said, you're on the hydroponic side, then the grow media itself isn't going to contribute too many nutrients even though it tests to have some. You've got to be able to have that soil solution there because you're on that grow, because you're on the hydroponic side, you have to be, you have to have moisture in order to be able to drive that solution in order for the plants to be able to have access to it. Mm -hmm. Buy the solution up, the nutrients go and get locked up and they go back into their solid salt state or they get locked up with something else. You've got to be able to keep them soluble. And that was one of the things I think we discussed a little bit was, was changing your watering practices a tiny yep. bit and yep. to, to maintain that solution a little better. Yeah, we were, so I did, I flushed the soil pretty well and waited as the calcium levels came down. I added gypsum and, um, and I, we're, we're due for another soil test um, since I've added the gypsum and before my next run. So I'm excited to see how that's going to go and um, and stuff, but the conductivity was was cool to me because it's sort of like you're basically saying that you use it to determine how much of the two tests you use against each other, like how important they are against each other. Is that? It is. It is. Yeah. Um, it's also. I mean, there's more to it than that. I mean, the plant has a specific conductivity and a specific mineral solution and you have the, 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 the mineralogy that's in the soil and it comes in and out of solution based on bacteria or how we influence that solution. And if you don't keep that conductivity a little closer, the plant has to give up some water to be able to take, to dilute, either create some a solution for that nutrient to go into and, and in order for it to take it up, in order for it to be absorbed, there has to be almost an equality in that conductivity. And there's gonna be a give and take between the soil solution and the plant. And, and that having, making sure that the soil solution is there is as important and, and takes some of the stress off of the plant, being able to have to take it away and, and or have easy access to it, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, that does make sense. Um, none of this stuff is easy to understand. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's like to you, it's it's grade school. But I think it's important to kind of spread this information and make it available to the layman grower who may not have a, you know, a background in agronomy or, or horticultural science. Well, sometimes those analogies there allow you to visualize what I'm talking about. If you can... Yep relate to the analogy then that kind of sinks the what i'm trying to uh, give you for 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 science and give you something to associate with that and tie the two things together and that 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 a lot of times is sometimes the science is, is so ding dong complicated and it, it I, you know it's 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 ridiculous and and it's not where the rubber meets the road you've got to you've got to be able to be able to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it um, uh, because, uh, and to do it, to follow it blindly, I think is a mistake as well. Sure. And what's the beauty of these the, you cannabis guys is you guys are for the most part are so well studied and read up and you're, you're looking at things and asking a lot of questions and it's actually, it's fun. 
to be able to answer them and 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 turn the light bulbs on and go, oh, wow, that's why that works. Yeah, it's totally. And so I see myself as like an in-between, you know, I, I can kind of like help divulge this information into a digestible format. And John, I mean, you guys are both really good at that, which is how I've understood everything you've told me. So it's been a really exciting experience. And, and, yeah. um, um, that Eric and I both come from the traditional ag background. And I, and one of the first things that we talked about when we started this was that the first piece of anything that we do is going to be helping educate uh, people in the cannabis industry and, and show them why this is important. Um, but, you know, we weren't going to have any clients unless we got people to understand the basics first. And so I think all business aside, Eric and I both consider ourselves educators first. That, that's the first most important piece. And that's why we try to use Instagram as a tool to help shed some light on some of this complex stuff and kind of clear up some of the mysticism that's out there. Um, so that's, that's, our, that's our main focus, first and foremost, is, is helping people understand some of that complex stuff. We're rowing the same boat, and I appreciate you guys for it. That's for sure. Well, and what's complicated sometimes is is the some of the snake oil, you know, pixie dust salesmen blow a lot of smoke, and they 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 veil some of the the science and and the relational things that go on in order to sell their products, and and that and that's anywhere you go. I mean, whether it's personal health or whether it's you know, any other part of agriculture, there's a lot of that stuff out there. There may be a grain of truth in there, but you've got to be able to find out what that grain of truth was before they went and, and blew it all out of proportion. Do you, do you want to give a snake oil salesman example at all? Something you've seen? <laughs> that made you guys laugh and chuckle? Oh, I got one for you. Uh-oh. No, no, no. I'm not going to drop any names. You guys made a really relevant post. I would, I'm not that, I'm not that, uh, dramatic. Um, <laughs> the one that comes to my mind is that the one that was in Michigan a lot, the green bottles before, oh, yeah, before right. a name drop anything, but well, I mean, there, there's just a lot of stuff that people are selling. Oh, right. Yeah. Exactly like that. Yep. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of stuff that people are selling that, uh, and I'll let Eric give the analogy of, of if me, Eric, and Wait, Aaron sh show that. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That. Um, but you know, if me, Eric, and Aaron were getting together and drinking a couple of coffees or beers or whatever have you, and uh, going to the bathroom in a five-gallon bucket, slapping a label on it, you know, it'd be it'd be stronger than what a lot of stuff are buying for you know, fifty dollars or more a gallon. Yeah. That's one thing that, you know, we've been to MJ BizCon and a lot of the other big trade shows. And that's what we can't believe. You know, this is a good example of something that doesn't have a name on it or anything like that. But right. just watch out for those low grades Dude. because what is the other percentage out there? 95% of the products at your local grow store are going to be this exact thing. Yeah, there's a lot of safety built in there and they're selling water. Yep. And, you know, you can, it'd be almost impossible to kill plants with that unless you actually rooted them in it. And um, it's just, I, but I, that rubs me the wrong way. Too many times, um, you guys are educated enough to be able to use a more concentrated solution and, and to be able to do that. And, and, and honestly, that, that, I mean, you could, you could, you could start your composting toilet and have more nutrients in <laughs> in any of that than you would in in, a, in ninety percent of some of the packaged materials we've seen. Shh, but, don't tell the grocery store employees. <laughs> I, and I think I think another thing that's driving that is right now people are growing cannabis. You know, I mean, obviously here, like in the Midwest or East Coast, it's way different than the West Coast, but still comparatively for your traditional crop, the profit margins for cannabis are so high. I don't think people are really taking into consideration. Am I really getting my, you know, ROI on this 
expensive pail of water. I think right now the bottom hasn't fallen out and that people are just, oh yeah, I'll buy it, I'll buy it, I'll buy it. And that's the mentality is the more they add in, the better their product is gonna be. And I think that the only reason why the train of thought exists is just because they're getting, you know, I don't know what you guys are getting a pound, but 2000 at the least or something like that. Right. So that that's it. It's just that cannabis is so lucrative that 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 it, that these companies have taken advantage of it. But in the future, when cannabis is a dollar a pound, we're going to start like we're going to be grateful for people like you that have optimized, you know, these um, protocol that minimize cost. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the whole name of the game is here's your quality benchmark. How much can you spend per year before you start dipping down? And I think a lot of people are spending way much. And where is that quality drop off at or increase at? Yeah. So maybe an important metric, um, not only for profitability, but for the environment, too. So well said. Yep. Cool. That's a cool place to end. I appreciate your guys' time today, as always, and I look forward to working with you guys again, If unless there's something else you guys wanted to, to talk about. Nothing popped into my head. Well, I, I just had a quick question. The, the thing I was just showing, the kelp meal, can we show that? Because it seems like an example of something that you bought where it's advertised and then you sent it in for a sample and you got back That's different. Can we show it? Yeah, show it. Um, it actually came back. I, I was happy with the results. Yeah, I um, came the kelp. I don't think there was anything crazy. There wasn't. There. It was like within, you know, a tenth of a percent on all those numbers. The only thing that's important to note about the test are well, obviously the the micro and mineral nutrients are super important because that's what we were using the kelp for, but. The really the most important thing is the salt. We were worried that the salt was going to be a little high, the sodium, and it came back at three percent or sixty-one pounds per ton, which is a super low number when you're using like three pounds of this or six pounds of this stuff in fourteen cubic yards of soil. Right. And I think another thing that we didn't even touch on um, was the solubility of the sodium, even in in materials like kelp. Uh, sodium you could leach it out with irrigation water really easily so even even if that was a problem right. so I long think, as you don't have high sodium in your irrigation water yeah right. yeah exactly. but yeah i mean just as an as a amendment by itself a lot of that sodium will probably go away relatively quick yeah so i mean if i'm looking at somebody that's got i've been over fertilized you know one of the first things and we've got conductivities that are creating issues with, with burning some roots. But when I tell them to flush, the first things that I expect to go are, are sodium, chloride, sulfur, and nitrates. So those four things are gonna be what's going to be in that leachate water as it, as it comes out the bottom of the pot or the bed. And um, that's gonna greatly, the chloride and the sodium are, are going to pull that conductivity down. Not necessarily, and depending on how much sulfates we have, we might have to add some back, but um, it's not it's not that big of a deal, um, but then um, yeah, you just gotta you know nitrates. Too many times you know if I'm dealing with 200 or 300 parts per million nitrates, um, that there's no way that plant's ever gonna shut down. With that much nitrogen there, that plant is going to want to stay as an annual, a, a perennial, not an annual. It's gonna say I just I've got so much nitrogen, I'm just gonna continue to vegetate. Why should I go through my life cycle? And, and so that's another thing what we tried to talk, talk about doing is, is triggering that plant and creating that stress at the end of its life cycle to say, I need to reproduce. And, and sometimes, and that's pulling some of those nutrients back. And too many times the treadmill goes on high as far as nutrients go and it stays on high. And that plant, the only mechanism that tells it that it needs to mature is you guys changing the lights. And a lot of, if there's too much nutrient there, that, that mature, mature maturation of that plant and finishing its life cycle isn't going to can be complete if there's this huge tidal wave of uh, soluble nutrients hitting it in the butt. Right. And we talked about dialing back nitrogen three or four weeks before uh, senescence too. 
to kind of prevent that. And that's important too about nitrogen is, you know, ramping it down. It's, it's kind of a catch 22. You've got to keep enough nutrients there to make sure that it translocates to the flower. But too many, you don't want to have this massive load of nutrients just sitting there making that plant continue to veg out. And, it, and even if you prune it that, even if you prune it down, it's still going to what it's, it's not going to, some of that will go to the flower, but it's still going to try to, it's still, it's going to, it's going to sucker out. If you would leave it go, you would see that. But anyhow, yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I have a quick, uh, totally random question, but you, you guys are based in Ohio. Is that where you are? Yes. Okay, so you're you're kind of smack in the heartland, near the heartland of kind of modern American industrial agriculture. So I feel like th there's a lot of movement in the cannabis space towards, you know, living soil, regenerative, uh, you know, Korean natural farming. And obviously you guys are, you know, pretty close to the mega corn farms that use uh, synthetic fertilizers and all that stuff. So what are you seeing in the traditional ag world? It, are any of these kind of concepts resonating of, of, you know, building microbial health back up in the soil and moving away from uh, chemical fertilizers, or is it still like business as usual? And, and, and then, and then part two of that would be if you guys were growing cannabis and I assume you're near, you're looking out on a backyard or something, uh, how would you want to grow it in your own backyard? Hydro, uh, aquaponics, and that, you know. Well, I, I think in, there's two, that's kind of living soil. Yeah, I think there's a couple important things to consider. Um, and I have some involvement with a grow here in Ohio. And I think backyard is one thing versus a commercial scale when you have 30 or more employees under you. Um, and I think you know, those are two different worlds right there. Um, so, you know, home grow with it's just you and a couple other people, I would definitely do a soil all day long. Uh, but when it's a commercial scale and we need to make sure we're hitting numbers and producing clean medicine for people that's consistent, um, I'm, I'm hydroponics all day long just because, uh, like I said, duplicating results and consistency and clean medicine seems to be the name of the game. And uh, a lot of times with living soil and especially, you know, Ohio, especially, um, it's just hard to pass testing all the time with even things that we know aren't necessarily bad, um, but sometimes those living soil systems will help, will lead to failed testing. So, um, home grow all day long. I'm, I'm a soil boy, uh, but um, commercial, I still think hydroponics are where it's at. I think it, it can be done, but you know, just how I might think something's wet, Eric might not. And I think that's uh, something that resonates in a commercial grow with multiple employees that are trying to do a living soil system. It, it can be done. We're working with some people that have some pretty big grows um, that are doing pretty good consistent results in living soil, but, um, that just the dry down times and when to water and how plants behave, you know, each genetic behaves differently. Uh, I think that's a tricky one to master, but I unless it's like, unless every one of your employees are a skilled grower, it's almost impossible to scale up living soil and not almost impossible. It's extremely challenging. Yep. I, and like I said, there, there are some people that we're working with that are in a huge rack market and they're, you know, 30,000 plus square feet of living soil beds that are on their, I don't even know, 20th run and they're, they're doing good. Um, but still, you know, each thing's, there's not one right magic bullet, you know, with hydroponics, it's going to have its downfall with living soil beds, it's going to have a downfall. So it just depends. Um, I think, how large and scale you're talking about and what your desired outcomes are. Yeah. And, and then the other question I had asked was for, forget cannabis, just talk about general trends in agriculture. Is, is there an awakening to the old is the new normal, like going back to how it was before chemicals or is everyone still growing their soy and corn the same way? 
you know, the, well, there, there's a, because of the depressed commodity prices, the, the, the commercial agriculture is looking at ways to reduce their inputs and maintain um, some semblance of productivity or take a little bit of a hit, but not too much. The, the, so one of the other laboratories I work with is called Brookside and they do a soil health test. And one of the things that they're finding is the diversity of the, the diversity of the biology and the level of organic matter that's in that soil are what's going to determine the productivity of that plant minus the, the salt fertilizers that we add. And so there's a, there's a, there's, there's actually some studying going on. The, what the problem is, is that the last 150 years, you know, I've got, I've got a client or had a client in Chicago where they had a native, an untouched prairie soil. And I actually took a sample of it. It was 10% organic matter. And, um, what happened over the last 150 years is we took every piece of prairie soil and every piece of topsoil, we took all the trees off of it and we started this tillage agriculture. And every time that organic matter got exposed to the air, it turned into carbon dioxide. And we went from 10% down to you know 2% or even 1%. And that organic matter is gone from these soils. And now they're looking at it and going, wow, that was important. How do we build it back? <laughs> and, and to scale that, it's really difficult. Cover crops are going to be part of that. Minimum tillage is going to be part of that. But um, you can't you can't just you took 150 years to strip that natural resource away. To put it back is going to take some time and some thought and some process. They're trying to, um, but I don't know that it's got a ton of traction yet. I, I think you can definitely notice it though in the on the consumer side. It seems like in the past five to seven years, there's been a huge demand for organic products and everything else. So I think if you're a smart farmer and you wanna make your business last for the next 75 years to 100 years, I think you're gonna to need to take some steps to go in that direction. I mean- Yeah, I, I think the other thing, I, I don't know, is nutrient density the word you'd use for like, you know, a tomato 50 years ago was full of minerals and vitamins and like that same tomato grown on that same land today probably has less of all of those things. That's, yes, is the short answer to that. I mean, there's, so that's one of the problems with, with commercial and commodity agriculture. You're paid based on, you're paid based on bushels. And, and sometimes there's a, there's a test weight, which gives us a, a density, not necessarily of minerals, but, but starches, carbohydrates, and protein. But there's no definitive, right? Once, sometimes you'll get into it with some, you know, soybeans are a little different. You get you get a protein content on that based with with bushels as well. But there should be there should be another metric. Our metrics in the cannabis industry are the CBD and THC, right? Uh, or hemp, if you want to throw that in there. Sorry, um, but um, but there's there needs to be not just a quantity mass number. There also needs to be a quality metric too. And whether that's just something as simple as shelf life for your tomatoes, if you've got a nutrient dense tomato that has a lot of sugars in it, that's going to translate into shelf life, right? For any of those vegetables. But if you, if you don't have that, I mean, you know, by the time it hits the truck and travels 2000 miles from California or Mexico and it's on the shelf and, and in two weeks, it's turned into a mold snot ball. <laughs> you, you, all that is, is just, that's, that's just water and, and fiber. That's not a good thing. Right. So we need to, how do you get that metric? This, the, the perception is, is that your organic people, are paying more attention to that than the organic agriculture. Um, but there's, there's other than that qualitative, you know, shelf life appearance, taste thing, there aren't any other things going on, right? So, so just quickly, and, and, and then we can uh, break. Uh, Greg McAllister said, soil analysis is a good tool, but sap analysis tells us what the plant is taking up. Are, are you doing any sap analysis? We do the tissue analysis, which is, tissue, not sap. Yeah. it's the same thing. Essential. In my understanding, sap tests need to be done on site. It's not something you can kind of pack away and send for. You, you, you get a, uh, they have these little meters that you put a piece of sap a little bit of sap on the slide 
and it shines a light through it and it can tell you some of the micro and macronutrients. I would trust the lab over that. I would too, which is why you guys use tissue analysis, not sap testing. I, I no. thought there was some people doing sap testing in like Colorado that was through a lab. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm mistaken on that, but. It might be local. I, I know uh, Nick Tomasini um, introduced me or pointed out David now now is from apical up in uh either i think they're in oregon or washington but uh that that, that was my introduction to sap analysis was from nick tomasini yeah we've from looked U we've looked at a couple sap results you remember that yes and they're they're really similar i thought to the tissue results so i wouldn't see us having any problem interpreting people's sap results if they wanted to but currently as it stands you know the lab that we use doesn't do that so but if you have data then we can interpret it but so that's that's there's 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 what kind of i you know in all these industries there's i call it art right so you take the really hard science so we test the soil in two different ways and then we can test the, the plant parts whether it's the tissue or the sap or whether it's the the, the flower and or the seed which we show CBD and we can we can look at that and and kind of manipulate what's going on in between the more data that you have the assumption is, is the better the decisions that you can make um, and but at some point you know without our intervention mother nature's existed for quite a while <laughs> um, how do we, uh, to me, that's the other balancing factor of that side, getting the hard science to work with, with what's a natural plant and a setting and, and getting those things, the two things to come together in an, in an equitable and beneficial process. That's where the art comes in. And um, you guys um, growing on a day-to-day -day basis and looking at those plants, um, there's a lot of art there. And I'm, I'm just trying to bring a little science to the art side of it. But there's some art in what I do too. So it's kind of, it's fun. It's really cool stuff. <laughs> it is so much fun to talk to you guys and work with you guys. I, I, I think Eric's last co comment was kind of the, the mic drop moment for this conversation. Absolutely. And uh, to the 90 or so people still tuned in uh, two hours or well, yeah, two hours later, we appreciate your time. Aaron, thank you for emceeing the conversation. Uh, you did a great job, John and Eric. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, we look forward to having you back again. Yeah. You got Let's do it again sometime soon.